Hi, Janet. Hello, Rebecca. So, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to Sunday worship and to uh, another Zoom conversational sermon with my dear friend, the Janet. Uh, I wanted to point out a couple of things. You'll you'll maybe recognize this background, those of you who have uh, seen one of these sermons that I've done with my dad before, because I'm at my parents' house in Belleville. And so this is where dad usually records, and I'm uh, sitting in his spot. And I also just wanted to say, it's a little chilly in Belleville this morning. And so that's why I'm wearing a jacket. And I didn't think through the fact that I needed to bring a jacket that is a perhaps a bit more church appropriate than my fun, pearly, slightly ripped jean jacket. So I'm just begging forgiveness on that, it's fine. And I wanted to say to you that I started a series last week called In the Wilderness. Actually, uh, last week was maybe kind of uh, an introduction to that series, but also uh, that, that idea of being in the wilderness sort of resonated with me. And as the Janet and I talked and prepared, we both felt that there was more we could do there. So we're going to continue that for a little bit. And uh, today we're talking about Romans 12, 1 to, I think, 8? Mm -hmm. okay. 1 to 8, and we're talking a little bit about transformation in the wilderness. So I'm going to hand it to you, Janet, uh, to say whatever you want to say to begin us today. Well, I always look forward to uh, this time with you because it's so lovely to um, delve into God's word with a friend. Mm -hmm. So I thought before uh, we begin our time together, um, shall we pray? Yes, please. Okay. God of generous mercies. God of steadfast and faithful love, we ask that your Holy Spirit open our hearts, our minds, and our ears to how you are speaking to us this day. And Lord, as you speak to us, renew us, transform us, change us that we would be more like Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. And may your light spill from our mouths from our lives, from how we act and from what we say. For you are good and you long for our world to experience your wonderful goodness and your generous mercies. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for that. So we're talking about this passage in Romans, uh, which um, of course, I have it on my Bible app on my phone, and the title that uh, starts the passage is Living Sacrifice, um, and which I kind of think is, a, is a, a good thing, but also maybe something that makes us a little bit nervous, because sacrifice means discomfort, uh, and in the Hebrew world and in the Roman world, in which um, Paul writes this letter, that would have been a really uncomfortable thing because they would have known all about sacrifice uh, due to other religions around them, due to some of the practices of the day. So, um, so yeah, maybe um, what we want to start with is talking a bit about what living sacrifice is. Yeah, so um, this is one of these moments where I go, I have my notes and I'm blanking because I'm thinking, okay, was sacrifice no, it's the word worship. So, sorry. So we were talking about uh, living sacrifice and that that living sacrifice was, if you read further on, it's um, uh, the true, one version reads truly the way to worship him. Uh, another one is spiritual act of worship. I think your version had uh, reasonable service. Yes, reasonable service, yeah. And so, uh, the, why I wanted to connect the two, the sacrifice part and this, and this worship or this word service, um, what's really interesting is in the Greek, the word for worship or service is actually latreia. So um, services is, is probably more its intent. It's still worship, but it's the service or worship of God according to the requirements of the Levitical law. So isn't that interesting, right? The Levitical law. Um, so in other words, the being a living sacrifice really has to do also with, um, it's not just, uh, what word am I looking for? 
it's not something you do off by heart. It's not something you've memorized to do. It's not a ritual you do mindlessly. Rather, I think what Paul is trying to get at here, and this, and hence the living sacrifice, is how do we become? How do we come before the Lord? Right? Uh, we're. I heard this terrible joke. Um, the hard thing about a living sacrifice is it keeps on trying to get off the altar. Mm -hmm. True. And so, what does it mean to be a living sacrifice? Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts? So one of the things I read was talking about, you know, as they, as I said, they would have had the idea of sacrifice in their culture, but the thing about sacrifice as they knew it was it ended, right? You go and you put your animal on the altar and sacrifice it to God, the end. But what Paul is saying is living sacrifice, which means it goes on. It comes to the altar alive and continues to live on the altar. So it's more this idea of an ongoing way of life, an ongoing practice. And I really like that reasonable service piece because I think so often in these days, we think of worship as that thing we do for an hour on Sunday morning. And, and the thing that pulls at my heartstrings, um, the longer I'm alive, the longer I'm in ministry is not the just the hour that we do on Sunday morning, there's, there's important stuff there, but it's the, what do you do with all the rest of the hours of your week? How are you kind? How are you generous? What are you doing to present that reasonable service to God? Because the, the kindness you do outside of that hour, the goodness you pour into the world outside of that hour is your living sacrifice is your reasonable service is worship of God. And I don't think we always give it the holiness it should have. So. Yeah, no, I know what you mean. And I, and I think this is maybe a, a good segue then into this word transform. So uh, when we go into verse two, um, it reads, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person. Um, another translation is be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to look at this Greek word transform. So I'm just going to go on my computer here uh, because um, as we were talking when we were preparing for this, you know, in English we have uh, Two, form, two voices, right? Active voice and passive voice. So I threw the ball, the ball was thrown at me. So the interesting thing about this verb transform is it's in the passive voice. And in some ways I'm quite relieved it's in the passive voice because it means that I, I don't have to do all the heavy lifting on my own because boy, is it hard to change a habit. <laughs> um, as my, my congregation knows, uh, I'm a stress eater. So a bag of chips, uh, potato chips. Yep. Yes, that's my go-to, not healthy. Um, and how, how does one be transformed? Like in times of stress, how do we not allow what our bodies have become accustomed to, to dictate uh, how we live our lives? And so I love this this passive voice of the of the uh, verb transform because it means that we can allow God's Holy Spirit to do work in our lives. Now it doesn't mean we don't do anything, but but I think what it reveals to us is that there is a power to our God. And not only that, what's so interesting is it's in the present tense. So again, thankfully there are commentators who are you know experts in Greek because I would not have picked this up on my own. But because it's in the present tense, it means it's not like a one-time deal right it's not like uh you shoot you score yeah you're done that goal right like that's it um rather it is something that happens every day just like we have to feed our bodies every day uh this transformation this renewing of our minds it's something that has to happen regularly and i love that because in the presbyterian um world we talk about being a reformed church but we talk about being a reforming church we're reformed and reforming we are transformed and transforming it's ongoing and should ch we're so bad at change some ways but we actually should be good at it because our theology is that god continues to act in our life and continues to uh bring out 
new things among us, which also um, calls back that, that Isaiah, see, I am doing a new thing, mm. right? He always is, uh, but we don't always feel comfortable with that, which is, which is a little bit tough. And I was thinking about that because I read your email about the fact that it was actually um, passive. And I was thinking, yeah, but my fear is that we would just go, oh, well, God's got to do the work. I'm just going to sit back and not worry about it. And so I was trying to struggle through that a bit this morning. And I was thinking, yes, God does the work, but God does the work by inspiring us to do the work, by moving us to do the work, by, um, by, by all these different ways that, that his word comes to us. And so I was on Facebook as one is in 2020 and scrolling through and um, I'm a big fan of the band Need to Breathe. And they have a new album that they've been releasing sort of a song at a time since about April. And it's, I think, fully out at the end of August. And what they just released was a video for the song, Who Am I? Mm -hmm. And this song, there's, there's two pieces of it that, um, that I just love. One says, uh, somehow you really love who I really am. And I love that because that's, that's God, right? God loves who we really are when we're a mess, when we're a train wreck. And then it later on says, you grow your roses on my barren soul. Because again, that's who God is. He springs up flowers out of this barren wilderness. He transforms the wilderness within us. And I just, so that kind of gave me the goosebumps this morning. And, and I had to, I had to share that because, you know, I think in song lyrics. So, um, but I, but also the main part of that song says, who am I to be loved by you? And so I think there's a piece of this that, as all things in Christianity should, harkens back to that idea of being loved into being a new person. Mm -hmm. The love part is so important. So no, I love that. Um, and I think that's so important, being loved into being a new person, because for me, what is the wilderness? Uh, Sometimes when we think about wilderness, you know, there's the Canadian wilderness, which in some ways is beautiful, right? There's the wilderness that we think about in, of course, biblical times, which would be dry. Uh, it would be the desert. And so when I think about that, um, you know, the, the barrenness of that, or perhaps the isolation in the Canadian wilderness, uh, when we are conformed to the world, when we follow uh, the cultural customs and habits uh, of the world that truly does not love who we really are, you know, thinking back to your lyrics, I think that's the wilderness. We get caught up in what we think uh, we need to be, uh, the expectations of the world or how the world defines success, but that doesn't necessarily love us into being right like to be who god has really called us to be to use the gifts that we have and using the gifts that we have doesn't mean we always stay in our comfort zone that's not what i mean but but to truly relish um and savor the the talents that the lord has blessed us with uh, so when i think about being transformed this this daily renewing of our mind sometimes uh you know, unfortunately, we have certain ideas of, of words and we think, oh, it's just cognitive. But the mind in the Greek here, I'm just trying to find my notes um, here. So the word mind denotes, uh, generally speaking, uh, the seat of reflective consciousness, comprising the faculties of perception and understanding and those of feeling, judging and determining, right? So um, I love this reflective consciousness. So, uh, and, and faculties of perception and understanding. And you, we need our heart to understand. You can't just do it from here. Uh, we can 
empathize with someone who who celebrates, uh, let's say, a wonderful occasion or a serious loss. But when we personally experience that same celebration or same loss, it brings a greater depth, does it not, to how we see, perceive, and understand? Yep. And I, I love that you talked, there's two things I want to say about that. You, you talked a bit about, you know, this, this neat, this sense that we have of conforming to the world, which is why you have to, you know, apologize for wearing your jean jacket, because you're worried about what people are going to think, and they're going to think that you weren't reverent enough. Um, so totally, I get that. Uh, but you also talked about gifts, which is where this passage goes. And it says, whatever gifts you have, use them. Whatever you're able to do, do it, because this is how you serve God. This is how you are transformed, that God has given you abilities. And I think one of the things that breaks my heart sometimes in congregational ministry is that we see these people, like, I don't know about you, but I look at my congregation and I see people all the time doing things that I couldn't imagine doing, that I know I'm not good at. Mm -hmm. And they're just like, well, I just, do that. That's not a big deal. It's, you know, like they downplay their own gifts. And I'm like, no, that, that is a gift God has given you because he really loves who you really are, but also because he hasn't given me the same gifts. And what God does is call us together so that we're, we're stronger together so that when all of us are using our gifts, there's a whole picture. It's not just a piece of what it could be. Right. right. And I love how you, how you bring that uh, to the last uh, verses of our reading, because that's the whole, I don't know, the whole point, but, but that's the thrust of this passage, is it not that the renewing of the mind being transformed is not just for me, right? It we have been called to live in community. God has given us the blessing of community. And as you share the gifts that, that uh, your congregants have, as, as do people in my congregation, uh, do not give me a hammer. <laughs> um, you know, uh, there are people who quietly take, uh, you know, some of our seniors on, on doctor's appointments. They drive them to and back. Uh, they help them with their grocery shopping. They call. Like, there are so many things people do very quietly that don't necessarily get talked about, but are certainly the, the glue that helps us to stay as community. Yeah. And, and this renewing of the mind, being transformed, it's, it's for the benefit of us all. And what would our world look like? What would our world look like if we could all allow God to love us into being, right? Yes. Yeah, that's a great great uh, place to land because we are getting towards our time. Um, so uh, I don't know what else to say other than um, that, I'm, that I'm grateful to you for uh, your openness to, uh, to doing this with me and to, to discussing these things because um, there's a lot of thought that goes into any sermon we preach, and, and you know that better than anyone because for the last six months we've been preparing together, and you know that our conversations are like two hours long and then sometimes some texts and emails afterwards. And um, yeah, just that, that careful and considered uh, passion that wants to think these three things through carefully so that what we share hopefully is our putting out of our gifts into the world to build up our community. So I thank you for that. Oh, and I thank you, Rebecca. Uh, really, friendship and being able to explore God's word is a gift, right? Like the time that we've been given in our call. And I pray that what we have shared will be a blessing to others in the wonderful mystery and wonder of the Holy Spirit. So blessings to uh, you and your wonderful um, congregation at Graceview. And also to all the wonderful people at Morningside High Park. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Trust that God loves you. God really loves who you really are, not just that nice facade that we sometimes present. So God bless and have a wonderful day. Amen. Amen. Bye.